Hi everyone, welcome to a new video about the listening test. Thank you very much for trusting me to help you learn and master English. Please keep listening and focusing on these tests to train your brain to understand the English language. This is very important for you. Don't forget to subscribe to be able to receive all the updates about this channel. I wish you the best of luck in your listening test. Part 1 Wants to relocate to the United States. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, and how can I help you? Good morning. My name is Sandra da Costa. I'm a first-year student, and I'm a bit confused about a few things. I was told by a lecturer to come here. OK, then. Take a seat, Sandra, and let me see how I can help you. Because this is your first year here, I'll need a few personal details. What did you say your name was again? Sandra da Costa. Is that Sandra? No, it's spelt with an O. So that's S-O-N-D-R-A. Mm -hmm. And can you spell your surname, please? It's D-A-C-O-S-T-A. Is that all one word? No, it's two words, actually. Fine. And are you living on campus or in other accommodation? I'm living in university residences in Bramble House, the one on the main campus, room number 13. How are you finding it so far? Much better than I expected. I have quite a large room, and we have a shared kitchen and bathroom. The other students I've met seem really friendly. That's good to hear. I think you've made a wise decision living on campus. Now, just a few more details, and then we can go on to discuss what's worrying you. Where are you from? My mother is from South America, but I was born in the north of Spain. That's interesting. And uh, one more thing. Do you have a number we can contact you on in emergencies? Yes, I have a mobile number. It's 07764-543302. Let's just check that. Did you say 07764-543332? No, it's 543302. That's fine, Sandra. Thank you. That's all the information I need for the moment. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm really worried about how I'm going to cope with university life. I mean, I feel like I don't know what's going on. Don't worry, Sandra. Most undergraduates feel like this in their first week. Well, maybe if I knew the campus a bit better, that might help. Do you have a map of the campus? Yes, I was given one during orientation week, but to be honest, I don't really understand it. Well, let's look at it together. OK, we are here now in Dalton House. Mm -hmm. Opposite this building is the arts block, where you'll find the computers. The computer rooms are open from 9am till 10.30pm weekdays, but closed on the weekends. Are there no other computers on campus? There are a few in the library that are available throughout the year, except Sundays. To get to the library, you keep going down University Lane, past the science block on your left. Opposite the science block are the chemistry labs, and the library is just on the right, next to Lab B. Fine. Another important building is the Students' Union. Turn left into Newton Drive. There are some trees and a little outside cafeteria. The Students' Union is just behind this. 
One thing I must check, have you sorted out your fees yet? Well, I filled in a direct debit form, so I suppose that means everything is fine. Probably, but you should go to the finance office just to make sure. It's at the end of Newton Drive. You'll need some identification, your passport or student ID. And is there a bank on campus? Yes, it's open normal banking hours and there is a 24-hour cash machine. The bank's in Isaac Street, which runs parallel to University Lane, where we are now. Go past Lecture Hall B and the bank is opposite, just before you get to Lecture Hall A. Great. Probably the best thing to do is to walk around and familiarise yourself with everything. Don't worry, it won't take you long to settle in. I'm sure you're right. I feel a lot better. I also need you to fill in this form for the tutorial file. Take it away with you and then make an appointment to see me again and we'll go over it. My telephone number is on the form here at the bottom of the page. You can ring me any time between 9am and 3.30pm from Monday to Friday, uh, except on a Thursday when I'm only available in the morning. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two teachers discussing a school trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Oh, there you are, Paul. Do you have a few minutes? Can we think about this year's school trip? Hi, Jean. Yes, of course. Have you got any ideas? I've been looking through some information, and I've brought a few leaflets with me. Here you are. Okay, thanks. Just remind me when the trip is. Next Friday. We'll be leaving at 9 and be back here at around 4, so we've probably got time to visit a couple of places. Let's see. What leaflet have you got there? Central Gardens. Looks like a nice place. It's open from 9 until 6, so we could go there any time we wanted, really. What about there in the morning and then somewhere else in the afternoon? Farmer's Market would be an option first as well, at least until they close at 1. Or we could try Grey Castle. That should be possible in the morning or in the afternoon. Oh, hang on. That's at the weekend. The last admission is at noon on weekdays. Greenhall says the same thing. Queen's Park opens at 8, so we could go there first. Or, according to these times, we could go there on the way back to school. Because they don't close the gates until sunset during the week. Okay, that gives us a few options. We went to Queen's Park a couple of years ago, didn't we? I seem to remember that the pupils really enjoyed it. It'd be nice to go somewhere new as well. I've seen groups from other schools going around Grey Castle. So have I. But then again, maybe we should play it safe and go to Green Hall. At least we've got experience of taking classes around there. Farmer's Market is popular with other schools, though, so it must be interesting. It'd be good to go somewhere where someone can show the pupils around, you know, explain things to them. I've been on a tour around the castle, and they do a really good job. I think they have guides at the hall, too, don't they? It says here that they used to, but don't anymore. You can get shown round Central Gardens, though. 
I think we'd have to do any explaining if we took the pupils to the market or the park. That wouldn't be a problem, though. No, and at least those two would be free, wouldn't they? I think all the others charge, and we'd have to get the parents to pay some money. I'm sure they wouldn't mind paying if it was a small amount. Let me check the leaflets. There's a special price for large groups at Gray Castle. Oh, but you can get into Central Gardens for nothing. Right. Oh, I've just thought of something. We wouldn't need to book anything if we were going to Queen's Park. But what about the other places? Uh, Central Gardens say you need to let them know if there are more than 10 people in your group, which would include us. The same at Gray Castle. Farmer's Market says you can just turn up, and so does Green Hall. Right. Well, I suggest we take the pupils to Gray Castle for a tour in the morning. How does that sound? Yes, sounds good. We should contact them to book it as soon as possible. In the afternoon, we can do something a bit more relaxed at the park, and we'll have to think about going to Green Hall another year. Shame Farmer's Market isn't open, but... We can't change the day. So that's a decision then. Now, let's think about what we're going to get the pupils to do. It's a school trip, after all, and we should give them some work to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I think they should know something about the place before they go. That way they know what they're looking at, and they'll be able to write about it better when they get back. I'll put some information together to look at at home, and give them copies after the next lesson. Good idea. I'll write something for them to do as they're going round the place. We did a quiz last year, and that worked really well. I'll do the same kind of thing this time. Okay. Now, what about the travel arrangements? How are we getting there? What do you think? I remember one year Mrs. Jackson took her group by bus, and that was a complete nightmare. Hmm. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We could hire a coach for the day, which is what we usually do. Or there's the train. It's rush hour, though, isn't it? So it'll be really crowded. And it'll be more convenient for the rest of the day if we've got our own transport. Yes, we'll do that then. Anything else? Oh, we need to let the parents know what's happening. We could ask the office to call everyone. It would take too long with so many. I know when we send a letter home, there are always a few pupils who lose it. But not all the parents have email yet, so I don't think we have any choice, really. I'll write something and take it to the school office this afternoon. Right. I'll go and tell the pupils the good news. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouille A, our all-around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The crankset has a 42-34 combination, running an 18-toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900, or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear three students discussing exam techniques with their tutor. First, 
You have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Morning, everyone. I thought we'd get together today and just talk about exam techniques. I'm sure everyone has different ideas about them. So, shall we find out what you do first when you get into an exam? Check that you have the right exam paper. <laughs> It sounds funny, but students do actually answer the wrong exam paper sometimes. So check that it's your exam first. Then what? Write your examination number on the answer sheet. Well, it might sound obvious, but writing your examination number at the beginning of the exam can be a good idea. Apart from making sure the examiner knows who wrote the exam, can anyone say why? It can help you relax? Yes, that's right. Doing something easy like that gives you a chance to calm down. Right, so what do you do next? Read the questions carefully. Well, before you read the questions, what should you do? Read the instructions. Yes, you should read the instructions next. You need to know how many questions you have to answer and whether you have to answer all the questions or only some. What other important information do you need to check before you start? How much time you have? Yes, Jerry's right. You need to make sure that you know how long the exam is so you can manage your time properly. OK, what do you do next? Read the questions? Yes, it's very important to read the questions, not just once, but several times. I usually make a few notes when I'm looking at the questions. Sometimes a question looks easy, and then when you start writing, you realise that it's actually more difficult than you thought. Yeah, but you don't want to spend too much time writing notes. No, but it's a good idea to jot down a few ideas to see if you can remember the arguments for the topics you studied most. Once we've decided, is it better just to start at the beginning and answer the questions as they appear on the exam, or should we start with the easy questions? Mm, well, I start with the questions that I know better and leave the ones I'm not sure of for the end. That's what I do. But I still keep an eye on the clock, especially when the questions are all worth the same number of marks. Max, right. If you write one very good answer, but it's only worth 30% of the marks, you still lose the other 70% on that exam. So it's better to write our main ideas for a question, even if we don't have time to answer it properly? Yes, absolutely. We can't give you marks for writing nothing. But if you give us your main ideas, we can give you some marks. Oh, really? I wish I'd known that in my last exam. I spent all my time writing a long answer to one of the questions and didn't get round to the other two. I didn't understand why I got such a low mark. Yeah, that's what happened to me. Luckily, my tutor explained it afterwards, so I never did that again. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.